Hi my loves and welcome to our very informal setup for my March books video. I have you on a tripod on my knees so you may move a little bit, I'll try and be still. Um, I need to film up in my room, I'm still in the States um, because there's always a lot going on with my sisters in the rest of the house so I need to film it up in my room and I wanted to protect my back rather than sitting on the floor because it already hurts a little bit. So um, I am doing this video from bed today. So first of all apologies that this video is late um, and also I'm very sad I don't actually have the physical books to show you guys for this month. Um, so you're just going to have to imagine a pile of about 12 or 13 books I think because I read most of them on my Kindle so I don't have physical copies anyway but also I'm obviously not at home still um, and for that reason as well I explained in my last video I haven't read my book club picks um, and I don't think I'll pick any for this month we'll just have a rolling book club picks um, for now. Yes I didn't have the books with me I was going to read them once I came home from my trip but I didn't come home from my trip so I have not read my book club picks. Now because March was a pretty crazy time globally um, I probably wasn't reading as well as I normally do so my notes are a little bit worse than usual and therefore I think my articulation in this video might be worse than usual but I hope you'll forgive me and I hope that this video gives you some good ideas for books to read um, if you are spending a little bit more time at home at the moment. So starting with the last two books in the Southern Reach trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer. You guys know I read Annihilation in February and loved it. Like definitely in my top books for 2020. Um, and so I read Authority and then Acceptance in the first part of March. Um, so yes, these are interesting books to talk about because they're not going to be for everyone even if you really enjoyed Annihilation because it sort of changes. I think the, the great thing about Annihilation is that it is um, surprising and it's a short little book but it really quickly draws you in to its world and it's kind of confusing and there's lots of um, horror elements and uncanny elements which really work well and the kind of surprise element of all of that and that world has worn off by the time you get to the second two books so yes it doesn't quite have that surprise amazing factor that I think Annihilation has and that's why I think some people tend not to enjoy um, the second two books as much however I really really liked them um, so Authority um, builds on the ideas from the first book and deepens them um, but in such a way as to only really deepen the mystery. So like Annihilation, this is another puzzle piece. It's not going to be satisfying in the traditional sense of sci-fi or anything. It's not going to explain its world completely. Um, it requires, I think Jeff Vandermeer's novels actually require a closer reading and a slower reading than you think they do because they're quite readable. But there's a lot in the particular phrasing of things, the particular vocab. But, and authority anyway, this middle book is people's least favourite, I think, from what I have gathered from reading reviews, um, because it's bureaucratic. So it's set in the Southern Reach, which is the kind of company that's overseeing these expeditions into Area X. Sorry, this is not going to make much sense to you guys who didn't watch my last video on Annihilation basically a bunch of female scientists go into this mysterious area x and crazy things begin to happen to them there this whole novel is set pretty much this whole novel is set in the southern reach so you're not in area x so it's kind of not got that element to it um and it follows a guy called control who's basically trying to resurrect a failing and ailing southern reach um all of its expeditions have been failures basically and um, its leader has recently gone missing in Area X, so he's brought in to kind of save it. Um, and he's a very unreliable narrator and a very strange character himself. Um, and it's about hauntings and repetitive and obsessive thought proce processes. It shows the importance of the border and the psychologist, who is a character from the Annihilation, and the Southern Reach in this whole world. So it's not really just about Area X. I think Vandermeer wants to show how it's about how Area X interacts with what's outside it and also what surrounds it, which is the border. Yes, I loved this. Genius in many ways, I said. It expands the world and the ideas in it, which I liked 
that world and ideas in the first place. Um, Control is very believable and painful. He's, I don't want to spoil anything, but he's not very effective. Um, and the, a lot of the strangeness and the sense of the uncanny is still very much there. However, like I said, it could drag for some people. It's not, these books aren't really action packed in the way you would think of action. Um, although there's a lot going on in them. And yes, I said it benefits from an attentive, close reading. And then Acceptance, which is the final book, probably would have a more widespread appeal again because it does go back into Area X. You get some answers as far as Vandermeer is willing to give you answers um, and a very beautiful conclusion, which I cannot actually remember. But according to my notes, it was a very beautiful conclusion, um, which I found moving, but I can't, I can't actually remember it. I think, um, yes, the middle of March really blitzed my brain. So I, again, I really liked this book. Um, it's about ecology, biology and our role um, non-human intelligence versus human intelligence or what it means what that border means um, science borders change subject and object it's about faith and relationships and all of that sort of stuff I loved it I think this trilogy is a little work of genius like I've said before this final installment will also not satisfy everyone you do not get all the answers you kind of have to search through the text to get your own interpretation of what's happening basically and all three of them work as sort of puzzle pieces informing each other um but yes so i love the southern reach trilogy it is weird and wonderful you have to be prepared for a certain level of weirdness beyond kind of normal um speculative fiction weirdness even but in my view it is very very good there's a lot packed in there um, okay, next up we have the two books that were kind of my difficult books. Um, so most of the time, i.e. when I'm at home and things are relatively normal, I'm reading up to five books. One of which is usually like a long novel or like a very intense novel that's kind of known, renowned to be hard work. In this case from January to March it was Duck's Newburyport by Lucy Ellman and the other book that I would usually kind of be reading intermittently over a few weeks or months is like some sort of non-fiction theory book um, which is Meeting the Universe Halfway which we'll talk about in a minute but first Duck's Newburyport. I've got my notebook here that's why I'm that's why I keep looking down. So it's a big fat book. I wish I had it to show you guys. It's a thousand pages long and there's not many paragraph breaks so it really is a big fat book. Um, so it's about an Ohio housewife's inner monologue. Stream of consciousness style and typically I don't really like stream of consciousness anything very much so I was a little bit apprehensive about that element going in. Um, and she basically, over the course of a few days, this housewife is thinking about everything that is contemporary and important to us in the world, as well as her own life and her own kids and her own husband and family and everything. So she talks about everything, um, gun violence, racism, um, Trump, climate change, medical debt, um, taxes, little news segments. Um, obviously it's particularly US focused and it's sort of an indictment of of modern American life and that is interspersed with sections on a mountain lion um, which are written in normal prose with paragraph breaks and all that sort of stuff. This novel I really really went back and forth with. Um, started off liking it then disliked it pretty strongly um, for the middle 500 pages or so and then I went back to liking it again at the end and ended up giving it four stars on Goodreads which is pretty high but yeah I read about 30 pages a day most days of the week um, and then I kind of went up to 50 pages a day as I was getting towards the end of it because I was getting a bit impatient. I actually think there is more going on in this book than you think there is going on and that it might be doing something different to what you think it's doing. Um, so there's a way that the thoughts spiral back to particular things, which also explains the title, but I won't I won't spoil that for you guys in case you do, because part of the enjoyment of this book, I think, is, think, is seeing where the narrator's thoughts snag um, and like what 
might be forming this whole this whole book basically so yes it is about contemporary issues um, but it's also more specific than you think Elman's done like a, an amazing job at actually creating a very specific person a very um, detailed universe the universe of that person um, and you really feel like she's real you really feel like you're in her head and also there's something interesting going on with time and when it's narrated um, it's certainly not over the course of a single day which is what some people say about it it's not over a single day um, to my mind anyway yeah I think other people have a problem with this novel that I've seen is that because it just lists loads of issues world issues um, it doesn't and it doesn't analyze them it's kind of a bit too surfacey but I actually think there's a lot more happening um, and I actually think, ridiculously, it would benefit from a rereading, which I know is kind of intense when it's like such a long novel and such a wordy novel. So I ended up liking it. You know, it's actually quite readable. Um, there is a lot of list. There are a lot of lists in there. Um, there isn't a lot of pause for reflection and analysis. Yeah, I think I will end up rereading this at some point. Just now that I do kind of know where it ends up to kind of track some of those particular themes a little bit better. It's not going to be for everyone. It really, really isn't. It's one of those Marmite books. Um, it repeats the fact that all the time. I don't know, someone must have count it, counted it, but it is basically most of the lists start with the fact that blah, 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 the fact that blah, 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 blah. And over the course of a thousand pages, you read the fact that so many times. Yes, I ended up struck by the achievement of this book, the sheer amount of research, Elman's amazing ability to create a world um, and create a person basically out of thin air. And I'd be intrigued to see what would come out in a second or even third reading. Okay, my loves, I just had to change my camera battery. So I'm sorry if I've moved slightly. Um, okay. Next up we have Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning by Karen Barad, which as I said is my kind of non-fiction book that I was reading. So um, even worse for this one, this is the book I most need notes on in the world and um, I don't have, I have a separate notebook for my non-fiction so I do not have access to that, um, it is not with me. So this one is a little bit more of a winging it sort of review, um, I will be writing my reviews when I get home um, in the hopes that my mind will be a little bit more switched on so I will link that up down below when it is ready um, and I'll pop it on my Instagram and everything if you'd like to hear if you'd like to read some more put together reviews or what I hope will be more put together reviews but anyway I'm not going to talk too much about the content of this book because it is extremely complex this book is probably one of my favorite um, pieces of theory or non-fiction I've ever read um, I used it in my dissertation and I also used a couple of other Karen Barad articles so I was sort of semi-familiar with her ideas already but I wanted to read the whole thing basically from start to finish which I didn't have time to do during my dissertation because it is slightly longer than some other contemporary theory so it was more like the four or five hundred pages mark but this is an absolutely incredible book and um, yes, so it ma what it does is it marries contemporary theory, which includes mostly kind of gender theory and social and contemporary social theory, like kind of post-structuralism and stuff, um, with quantum physics to, and she herself is a quantum physicist. Um, she's not um, humanities based by nature. Um, and she comes up with a powerful argument as to how things come into being and how meaning is created, which has effects on basically everything. And obviously she is kind of making the point of how um, sex and gender come into being and come into meaning and how they come to mean things. Um, and it has effects on causality and time and the way that time works. And it's all just amazing. And I love her. Um, so the writing style is fairly straightforward um, in terms of contemporary theory. It's not filled with endless jargon. That doesn't mean it's not difficult or it doesn't include difficult ideas, but yeah, she doesn't fill up her, her sentences with endless jargon and 
um, just stupid constructions <laughs> and all that sort of stuff, which really used to annoy me when I was reading a lot of contemporary theory for my masters. Um, it's good for both scientists and for humanities based people. Um, I would assume, I'm not a scientist myself, but she does kind of certain sections of the book appeal more to one than the other. So if you're less familiar with some of the theory, she kind of goes into explaining that. But in terms of the actual writing and everything and the chapters all build on each other and it all just makes sense. It's a very good piece of writing, as well as having the most amazing ideas in it. Um, it's good for me specifically. I always found Barad's work particularly useful because she really makes sense of a lot of things. If you've ever read Judith Butler and wondered what she really means by matter and how matter, the matter that she speaks about, really comes to mean things. Um, and just kind of felt like there's a gap somewhere in what she's talking about in terms of the actual matter part of it. Um, Barad really brings those elements in and makes sense of a lot of stuff. Um, and that's just a Butler example. She really fleshes out um, a lot of theory with the kind of quantum physics elements and the evidence-based elements, which is fantastic. So difficulty level, it is hard for me to say because I do I did my masters in contemporary literature, culture and theory. So I've read lots of theory, I read lots of Edinburgh. I have kind of experience in working my way through like difficult things, um, people trying to explain complex ideas in a difficult way. Um, I feel like an acquaintance with um, Butler, Foucault and um, Don Haraway would be useful before you go into this book to really um, have an appreciation of what Barad adds to those elements. But the thing is, is that this book is also written for scientists to get that element. So I don't know whether she she does explain it well, but I feel like for me this book felt like so much more of a revelation because I'd had that. And then I was like, and she really kind of built on it for me. Like I said, she is quite a straightforward writer. Um, in terms of that, it's not so tricky, but the ideas are pretty crazy. <laughs> so you have to have patience with it um, and you to work through those complex ideas. And it's not really like reading um, like popular science um, books. It is more... Um, intense than that but I would recommend it I mean it's fantastic um, it makes me want to read lots more about quantum physics and I just love her so much another book I would definitely recommend is Underland by Robert McFarlane um, and it is a piece of nature writing so it's non-fiction as well and it's about the Underland so he covers loads of different things that basically take place underneath the surface of the earth, that includes cave systems and underwater rivers, but also mining systems and underground cities, um, looking at ancient cave paintings, but also looking at um, quantum physics laboratories that have to be underneath the earth in order to eliminate noise and stuff from the surface. So it really covers a huge amount of um, information. And what was good about it was the writing was beautiful and it was also very clever and very thorough and very nuanced and very well researched. Often when I read these non-fiction books, um, they're not going far enough, which I'm sure you've heard me say like a million, million times. But this one actually really does the work. Um, he doesn't just have all the biology and science elements, he also has all the geology and ecology elements but he also has all the kind of literary references and the like history and all of that sort of stuff um, the mythological elements of writing about the underland so yeah it's fantastic the writing is really beautiful but also it's very accessible very readable um, and also perfect for this particular time in our lives when we're not going outside as much not leaving the house as much if you want to do a little bit of armchair traveling um, I would definitely recommend it and he will also, I don't know, there's something about his language that's very calming, even when he's writing about things that are definitely not calming. I loved it and I will definitely be reading more Robert McFarlane. 
Um, okay, next up we have Exhalation, which is a book of short stories by Ted Chiang. Um, I read his other collection last year, which I really enjoyed. And this one is also kind of a selection of sci-fi stories. Um, lots about parenting and raising kids, which when I thought about it, I, it was actually true of the first collection that I read as well. Well, at least the title story is about um, a parent. So yes, lots, lots about that kind of thing. I don't know if he has kids, but yeah, there's a real mix of stuff as well. Um, so the good. I thought the first two stories were excellent. This is where my brain and my memory gets a little bit fuzzy. <laughs> um, they're going to be really tricky to describe, aren't they? One is about, the first one is about a man in Baghdad, I think it's Baghdad, who um, basically is able to go back in time using a special doorway, but you can only go back in time for as long as as the doorway has existed and it's all about kind of how time works and it working kind of in a loop and also all simultaneously and then the second one was about a strange society where there's these kind of mechanical beings and this being basically opens up his brain to see how it works he does like self-surgery auto-surgery and discovers the way his brain works. And that was quite a moving story. Um, but ultimately, I thought this collection was a bit disappointing. Um, for me, anyway. There was something just about these stories. It was like they were heading in the right direction and then they would just veer just off the mark. I don't know quite why. I'd have to reread them and kind of delve into the logic that um drives each of the stories because it, it felt like some some sort of logical problem or like the science wasn't quite fully thought through in some of them i said it was like they were skimming alongside the idea that they wanted to talk about um i don't know if that makes any sense or if it's an experience anyone else has had or whether it's just my brain um but yeah i didn't quite connect with them in the same way um and I also usually don't mind cold language. Um, you know, lots of your authors use it to, to great effect. But in these stories, it just verged a little too much on the clinical side. So yes, I couldn't really connect with these ones as well. I will still be reading anything else that he writes because I do think he like, the idea starts in a really great place, but I just couldn't, I wasn't quite, maybe I just wasn't following them properly. Um, next we have Weather by Jenny Offal, which is a um, fairly kind of hyped book at the moment. It's fairly famous on the old bookstagram circles. Um, it's about a librarian who basically is a, the community therapist who's trying to raise her child, um, keep her relationship with her husband running um, properly and also keep her addict brother out of trouble and it's set during the Trump election so it's 2016. For some reason I really wanted to compare it to Duck's new report even though it is a little slice of a book compared to that book um, but like Duck's it deals with a lot of contemporary issues um, and anxieties but unlike Duck's it's in kind of spare sparse fragmented sentences and scenes um, so it's kind of a completely different form. It's like the antithesis to ducks form-wise, um, whilst having kind of similar content. And whilst it held my attention, um, and I was initially quite entranced by the language, like many authors, she's good at kind of observational stuff. Whilst I am less willing to accuse ducks of analysing its content properly, because I think that book is doing something else, actually. Um, this one I am willing to accuse of not fully analysing its content um, and fully understanding what it means to be a human now living in a kind of contemporary world um, and it ended up just being a bit surfacy. I definitely understand why it appeals to lots of people. Um, moving on to The Adventurous Sun, a memoir by Roman Dial. And it's written by an Alaskan scientist slash explorer who, um, whose son goes missing in, I think it's Costa Rica, doing his own exploring off track and 
his own adventuring basically. Um, so obviously uh, Roman Dial talks a little bit about feeling guilty um, for bringing his son up to be an adventurer and for then for his son to go missing whilst on the trail. It is mostly a description of events, there's not much um, going on beyond that. I wouldn't say that it is particularly affective um, in terms of the kind of loss portion. Um, I know that some people you know write about grief very intensely and very beautifully and this one is not so much about that but if you're kind of interested in those kind of more adventuring aspects and the kind of off the grid travel aspects and also the risks that come with that then you might be interested in it next up we have dune by frank herbert um which is an extremely famous sci-fi novel which is coming out as a film later this year i believe it's often called the kind of precursor to lots of um, contemporary sci-fi let me just see when it was written i think it was the 60s it was originally published in 1965 and I really thought I was going to like this book but ended up not enjoying it very much at all particularly because I read it at the wrong time like many people my concentration has been pretty bad recently and this is just one of those books you cannot read with a kind of flaky concentration because it is quite intense um, it's about a desert planet called Arrakis which produces a spice called melange um, which does all sorts of crazy things like extend your life and basically whoever controls the planet obviously comes into a great deal of wealth has a lot of power in the kind of galaxy i guess you would say galaxy or solar system i'm not sure um and basically it's kind of a set of warring aristocratic houses who are vying for control over this planet mixed in with the main character kind of being this sort of messiah figure so the good stuff about it it's got fantastic in-depth world building it's very intense you can see that the world is fully fleshed out um, lots of the ideas are ahead of its time um, i particularly liked the elements you've got the kind of hints that um, the earth has its own language um, however the bad Everyone talks about the dialogue when they talk about this book, I think. It's very formal, stilted, jarring. Um, it's like the construction of the sentences, like the grammar is weird. Um, it's n it doesn't flow. I kind of think there must be a point to all of that. And I think it's to make it all very alien and very different and feel very different and also feel very aristocratic. But, um, yeah, I did not have the concentration to focus on that dialogue. Yeah, I said it was convoluted, it was kind of, it's like convoluted somehow, like the way they speak to each other. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's, or if my brain is just convoluted or what. I am concerned about the borrowing that Herbert does from Middle Eastern cultures, Arabic cultures, Muslim cultures, without really reflecting that in his characters, or if the people who are indigenous to Arrakis are supposed to kind of reflect those cultures, then their depiction is a little bit worrisome. Yeah, so there was there's some questionable stuff going on there, especially because um, the spice element obviously sort of reflects um, oil, um, so it has lots of kind of real world um, equivalents, and then it just gets a bit weird if you think about who the novel is championing. So yeah. That also made me not very keen to read any more of this on top of the style um, and I just found it quite painful to get through in the end so I probably won't be reading any more um, reading any more there's absolutely loads of Jude novels loads I don't know I kind of get why some people like it because it is crazy world building but yeah too many problems for me okay we've got two books left We've got The Wise Man's Fear by Patrick Rothfuss, which I listened to. Um, as you guys know, I read The Name of the Wind in January and was not very impressed. Not as impressed as I was expecting to be. Um, and the problems continued in this book. So um, it is about growth, um, continuing on in his journey to become something 
I'm not sure what because the book doesn't want to tell me because it doesn't want to get to where we're going. Um, it's a very long book and it was very many hours of listening time. Um, so they're good. It's fine in a kind of chill way if you don't want anything too stimulating. But yeah, it goes nowhere. And also, so basically the first book he spends absolutely ages at the university and in the second book he still spends ages at the university. I'm just like, how can you get away with writing the second book and it be the same? Like the same, the same stuff. And then he does go someplace, some new places, um, but it's difficult to know what the point is. Um, he's crazily good at everything, every woman wants to sleep with him. I don't know, I think the second book made me dislike the first book more. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry for you guys Patrick Rothfuss lovers. Um, he's just, I, don't, I just don't think it's for me. Because most of it's um, narrated by Kvothe, whose voice I don't like. I, like I said before, I like the kind of um, the framing narratives. I like the bits that aren't his voice, but as soon as he starts speaking, I just really dislike the character strongly. So it just, it's never gonna be for me. Um, final book and my battery is flashing again. So I'm gonna try and be quick. This is The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. <sighs> New book by N.K. Jemisin. Um, I wrote my, dis my master's dissertation on her Broken Earth trilogy. I love her with all my heart and soul. Um, but sadly, this book was a bit of a disappointment for me. It's about New York basically coming alive. Um, so once they're a certain age, cities come alive and they kind of manifest themselves in a particular person. Um, but this New York is kind of wounded by white supremacy and gentrification um, and the various boroughs of New York, so like Brooklyn, Queens, have to come together and save the kind of original, um, I can't remember what the word is now, but the original manifestation of New York. So, it's Jemison. I can't hate it too much. I don't know whether I have higher standards for her. Um, so I kind of dislike this book more than I would have if it was someone else, but then I also think maybe I kind of like it a bit more <laughs> than I would if it was someone else because I just love her and I want to support her and everything. Um, it's based on a short story that she wrote that actually appeared in her, um, short story collection that she released a couple years ago, which I really like. I really like the short story. I think it totally works as a short story, but it just doesn't work for me as a book. Now, another thing, I don't think I'm this book's intended audience. I don't think it's my kind of thing. Other people, I think, will really enjoy this book, but it's just not for me. I guess after Broken Earth, Jemison wanted to just write something completely different and completely different in tone, because that's quite an intense series. Um, so this one's a lot more fun, it's loud, it's a bit more all over the place and lots of things are happening. I just wanted it to have more thought about what it means to be a city. There are some logical holes going on which may be fixed in further books. Um, she really likes to introduce wholly new things um, <clears throat> in kind of further books down the line um, in her trilogies from what I have noticed before. So. Some of those logical holes may be sorted out and I think maybe when the world deepens a little bit in further books, because this is the first of a trilogy, don't know if I said that. Um, the rest of it obviously hasn't come out yet because it's this one was released this year. So yes, yeah, some of that might, might be fixed in later books. I feel like if she deepens the world a little bit and provides a bit more of what it means to be a city that's alive, then maybe um, I kind of appreciate this one a little bit more. Um, but yes, there's not much nuance going through this book. There's quite a lot of cliches, um, and it's quite marvelly, is what I said, or like kind of um, comic booky in its style, which I kind of understand because she's a big fan of graphic novels, and she is currently writing new Green Lanterns. Um, but it's just not my it's not my cup of tea. So like I said, that might be why it's not for me. It's not my kind of book. I didn't love it. Um, although I totally appreciate what she's doing in saying that gentrification and white supremacy and stuff is kind of killing cities and the kind of diversity element, which I really appreciate and I've always liked 
that element of her work just um thought the execution wasn't perfect for me um but anyway you guys that is everything i'm gonna wrap up really quickly because my battery's definitely gonna die in about three seconds thank you guys for watching today i will see you hopefully with an actual pile of books actually that's so not going to be the case because i've just april's almost done and i've basically read everything on my kindle um but yeah some good books this month would particularly recommend southern reach trilogy underland if you fancy something that will kind of blow your mind a little bit or expand your universe then the karen barad i'd recommend and also ducks new report if you can find the concentration for that one um but that is everything for me thank you guys so much for watching today hope you enjoyed hope i wasn't too inarticulate and made some sense and i will see you again very soon bye